I take up the thread of my researches, which I broke off only to apply the principles I laid down to practical art and the appreciation of its works. The transition from the passivity of sensuousness to the activity of thought and of will can be effected only by the intermediary state of aesthetic liberty. And though in itself this state decides nothing respecting our opinions and our sentiments, and therefore it leaves our intellectual and moral value entirely problematical, it is, however, the necessary condition without which we should never attain to an opinion or a sentiment. In a word, there is no other way to make a reasonable being out of a sensuous man than by making him, first, aesthetic. But you might object. Is this mediation absolutely indispensable? Could not truth and duty, one or the other, in themselves and by themselves, find access to the sensuous man? To this I reply, not only is it possible, but it is absolutely necessary that they owe solely to themselves the determining force. Nothing would be more contradictory to our preceding affirmations than to appear to defend a contrary opinion. It has been expressly proved that the beautiful furnishes no result, either for the comprehension or for the will, that it mingles with no operations, either of thought or of resolution, and that it confers this double power without determining anything with regard to the real exercise of this power. Here, all foreign help disappears, and the pure logical form, the idea, would speak immediately to the intelligence, as the pure moral form, the law, immediately to the will. But that the pure form should be capable of it, and that there is in general a pure form for sensuous man, is that, I maintain, which should be rendered possible by the aesthetic disposition of the soul. Truth is not a thing which can be received from without, like reality, or the visible existence of objects. It is the thinking force, in its own liberty and activity, which produces it, and it is just this liberty proper to it, this liberty which we seek in vain in sensuous man. The sensuous man is already determined physically, and thenceforth he has no longer his free determinability. Therefore, in order to recover it, he must either lose the passive determination that he had, or he should enclose already in himself the active determination to which he should pass. If he confined himself to lose passive determination, he would at the same time lose with it the possibility of an active determination, because thought needs a body. In form can only be realized through matter. He must therefore contain already in himself the active determination that he may be at once both actively and passively determined. That is to say, he becomes necessarily aesthetic. Consequently, by the aesthetic disposition of the soul, the proper activity of reason is already revealed in the sphere of sensuousness. The power of sense is already broken within its own boundaries, and the ennobling of physical man carried far enough, for spiritual man has only to develop himself according to the laws of liberty. The transition from an aesthetic state to a logical and moral state, from the beautiful to truth and duty, is then infinitely more easy than the transition from the physical state to the aesthetic state from life pure and blind to form. This transition man can effectuate alone by his liberty, whilst he has only to enter into possession of himself and not to give it himself, but to separate the elements of his nature and not to enlarge it. Having attained to the aesthetic disposition, man will give to his judgments and to his actions a universal value as soon as he desires it. This passage from brute nature to beauty, in which an entirely new faculty would awaken in him, nature would render easier, 
and his will has no power over a disposition which we know itself gives birth to the will. To bring the ascetic man to profound views, to elevate his sentiments, he requires nothing more than important occasions. To obtain the same thing from the sensuous man, his nature must at first be changed. To make of the former a hero, a sage, it is often only necessary to meet with sublime situations, which exercises upon the faculty of the will the more immediate action. For the second, it must first be transplanted under another sky. One of the most important tasks of culture, then, is to submit man to form, even in a purely physical life, and to render it aesthetic as far as the domain of the beautiful can be extended. For it is alone in the aesthetic state, and not in the physical state, that the moral state can be developed. If in each particular case man ought to possess the power to make his judgment and his will the judgment of the entire species, if you ought to find in each limited existence the transition to an infinite existence. If lastly, he ought from every dependent situation to take his flight to rise to autonomy and to liberty, it must be observed that at no moment he is only individual and solely obeys the laws of nature. To be apt and ready to raise himself from the narrow circle of the ends of nature to rational ends, in the sphere of the former, he must already have exercised himself in the second. He must already have realized his physical destiny with a certain liberty that belongs only to spiritual nature. That is to say, according to the laws of the beautiful. And that he can effect without thwarting in the least degree his physical aim. The exigencies of nature with regard to him turn only upon what he does, upon the substance of his acts. And the ends of nature in no degree determine the way in which he acts, the form of his actions. On the contrary, the exigencies of reason have rigorously the form of his activity for its object. Thus, so much as it is necessary for the moral destination of man that he be purely moral, that he shows an absolute personal activity, so much is he indifferent that his physical destination be entirely physical, that he acts in a manner entirely passive. Henceforth, with regard to this last destination, it entirely depends on him to fulfill it solely as a sensuous being, a natural force, as a force which acts only as it diminishes, or, at the same time, as absolute force. As a rational being. To which of these does his dignity best respond? Of this there can be no question. It is as disgraceful and contemptible for him to do under sensuous impulsion that which he ought to have determined merely by the motive of duty, as it is noble and honorable for him to incline towards conformity with laws, harmony, independence. There, even where the vulgar man only satisfies a legitimate want. In a word, in the domain of truth and morality, sensuousness must have nothing to determine, but in the sphere of happiness, form may find a place, and the instinct of play prevail. Thus then, in the indifferent sphere of physical life, man ought to already commence his moral life, his own proper activity are already to make way in passivity, and his rational liberty beyond the limits of sense. He ought already to impose the law of his will upon his inclinations. He ought, if you will permit me the expression, to carry into the domain of matter the war against matter, in order to be dispensed from combating this redoubtable enemy upon the sacred field of liberty. He ought to learn to have nobler desires, not to be forced to have sublime volitions. This is the fruit of aesthetic culture, which submits to the laws of the beautiful, in which neither the laws of nature nor those of reason suffer.
which does not force the will of man, which by the form it gives to exterior life, already opens internal life. Accordingly, three different moments or stages of development can be distinguished, which the individual man, as well as the whole race, must of necessity traverse in a determinate order if they are to fulfill the circle of their determination. No doubt, separate periods can be lengthened or shortened through accidental causes which are inherent either in the influence of external things or under the free caprice of men, but neither of them can be overstepped and the order of their sequence cannot be inverted either by nature or by the will. Man, in his physical condition, suffers only the power of nature. He gets rid of this power in the ascetical condition, and he rules them in the moral state. What is man before beauty liberates him from free pleasure, and the serenity of form tames down the savageness of life? eternally uniform in his aims, eternally changing in his judgments, self-seeking without being himself, unfettered without being free, a slave without serving any rule. At this period, the world is to him only destiny, not yet an object. All has existence for him, only in as far as it procures existence to him, a thing that neither seeks from or gives to him, is non-existent. Every phenomenon stands out before him, separate and cut off, as he finds himself in a series of beings. All that is, is to him through the bias of the moment. Every change is to him an entirely fresh creation, because with the necessity in him, the necessity out of him is wanting which binds together all the changing forms in the universe, and which holds fast the law on the theory of his action, while the individual departs. It is in vain that nature lets the rich variety of her forms pass before him. He sees in her glorious fullness nothing but his prey, in her power and greatness nothing but his enemy. Either he encounters objects, and wishes to draw them to himself in desire, where the objects press in a destructive manner upon him, and he thrusts them away in dismay and terror. In both cases, his relation to the world of sense is immediate contact, and perpetually anxious through its pressure, restless and plagued by imperious wants. He nowhere finds rest except in innervation, and nowhere limits save in exhausted desire true his is the powerful breast and the mighty hand of the titans a certain inheritance yet the god welded round his forehead a brazen band advice moderation wisdom and patience hid it from his shy sinister look every desire is with him a rage and his rage prowls around limitless, Iphigenia, and Taurus. Ignorant of his own human dignity, he is far removed from honoring it in others, and conscious of his own savage greed, he fears it in every creature that he sees like himself. He never sees others in himself, only himself and others, and human society, instead of enlarging him to the race, only shuts him up continually closer in his individuality. Thus limited, he wanders through his sunless life, till favoring nature rolls away the load of matter from his darkened senses. Reflection separates him from things, and objects show themselves at length in the afterglow of the consciousness. It is true we cannot point out the state of rude nature, as we have here portrayed, in any definite people and age, is only an idea, but an idea with which experience agrees most closely in special features. It may be said that man was never in his animal condition, but he has not 
on the other hand, however, entirely escaped from it. Even in the rudest subjects, unmistakable traces of rational freedom can be found. And even the most cultivated features are not wanting that remind us of that dismal natural condition. It is possible for man, at one and the same time, to unite the highest and the lowest in his nature, and if his dignity depends on a strict separation of one from the other, his happiness depends on a skillful removal of the separation. The culture which is to bring his dignity into agreement with his happiness will therefore have to provide for the greatest purity of these two principles in their most intimate combination. Consequently, the first appearance of reason in man is not the beginning of humanity. This is first decided by his freedom, and reason begins first by making his sensuous appendix boundless, a phenomenon that does not appear to me to have been sufficiently elucidated, considering its importance and universality. We know that the reason makes itself known to man by the demand for the absolute, the self-dependent, and necessary. And as this want of reasoning cannot be satisfied in any separate or single state of his physical life, he is obliged to leave the physical entirely and to rise from a limited reality to ideas. But although the true meaning of that demand of the reason is to withdraw him from the limits of time and to lead him from the world of sense to an ideal world, yet this same demand of reason by misapplication scarcely to be avoided in this life, prone to sensuousness, can direct him to physical life, and, instead of making man free, plunge him in the most terrible slavery. Facts verify the supposition. Man raised on the wings of imagination leaves the narrow limits of the present in which mere animality is enclosed in order to strive on to an unlimited future. But while the limitless is unfolded in his dazed imagination, his heart has not ceased to live in the separate and to serve the moment. The impulse towards the absolute seizes him suddenly in the midst of his animality. And as in this cloddish condition, all his efforts aim only at the material and the temporal and are limited by his individuality, he is only led by that demand of the reason to extend his individuality into the infinite, instead of to abstract from it. He will be led to seek instead of form an inexhaustible matter, instead of the unchangeable and everlasting change, and an absolute securing of his temporal existence. The same impulse which directed to his thought and action, ought to lead to truth and morality. Now directed to his passion and emotional state, produces nothing but an unlimited desire and an absolute want. The first fruits, therefore, that he reaps in the world of spirits are cares and fear. Both operations of the reason, not of sensuousness, but of a reason that mistakes its object and applies its categorical imperative to matter. All unconditional systems of happiness are fruits of this tree, whether they have for their object the present day or the whole of life, or what does not make them any more respectable, the whole of eternity, for their object. An unlimited duration of existence and of well-being is only an ideal of the desires, hence a demand which can only be put forth by an animality striving up to the absolute. Man, therefore, without gaining anything for his humanity, by a rational expression of this sort, loses the happy limitation of the animal, over which he now only possesses the unenviable superiority of losing the present for an endeavor after what is remote yet without seeking in the limitless future anything but the present. But even if the reason does not go astray in its object or err in the question, 
sensuousness will continue to falsify the answer for a long time, as soon as man has begun to use his understanding and to knit together phenomena in cause and effect, the reason, according to his conception, presses on to an absolute knitting together and to an unconditional basis. In order merely to be able to put forward this demand, man must already have stepped beyond the sensuous. But the sensuous uses this very demand to bring back the fugitive. In fact, it is now that he ought to abandon entirely the world of sense in order to take his flight into the realm of ideas, where the intelligence remains eternally shut up in the finite and in the contingent, and does not cease putting questions without reaching the last of the chain. But as the man with whom we are engaged is not yet capable of such an abstraction, and does not find in it the sphere of sensuous knowledge, and because he does not look for it in pure reason, he will seek for it below in the region of sentiment, and will appear to find it. No doubt, sensuous shows him nothing that has its foundation in itself, and that legislates for itself. But it shows him something that does not care for foundation or law. Therefore, thus not being able to quiet the intelligence by showing it a final cause, he reduces it to silence by the conception which desires no cause, and being incapable of understanding the sublime necessity of reason, he keeps to the blind constraint of matter. A sensuousness knows no other end than its interest, and is determined by nothing except blind chance. It makes the former the motive of his actions, and the latter the master of the world. Even the divine part in man, the moral law, in its first manifestation in the sensuous, cannot avoid this perversion, as this moral law is only prohibited and combats in man the interests of sensuous egotism. It must appear to him as something strange until he has come to consider this self-love as a stranger and the voice of reason as his true self. Therefore, he confines himself to feeling the fetters which the latter imposes on him without having the consciousness of the infinite emancipation which it procures for him, without suspecting in himself the dignity of lawgiver, he only experiences the constraint and the impotent revolt of a subject fretting under the yoke, because in this experience the sensuous impulsion precedes the moral impulsion. He gives to the law the necessity of beginning in him the positive origin, and by the most unfortunate of all mistakes, he converts the immutable and the eternal in himself into a transitory accident. He makes up his mind to consider the notions of the just and the unjust as statutes, which have been introduced by a will, and not as having in themselves an eternal value. Just as in the explanation of certain natural phenomena, he goes beyond nature and seeks out of her what can only be found in her in her own laws. So also in the explanation of moral phenomena, he goes beyond reason and makes light of his humanity, seeking a god in this way. It is not wonderful that a religion which he has purchased at the cost of his humanity shows itself worthy of this origin, and that he only considers as absolute and eternally binding laws that have never been binding from all eternity. He has placed himself in relation with not a holy being, but a powerful. Therefore, the spirit of his religion, of the homage that he gives to God, is a fear that abases him, and not a veneration that elevates him in his own esteem. Though these different aberrations by which man departs from the ideal of his destination cannot all take place at the same time, because several degrees have to be passed over in the transition from the obscure of thought to error, and from the obscure of will to the corruption of the will. These degrees are all, without exception, a consequence of his physical state, 
because in all the vital impulsion sways the formal impulsion. How two cases may happen, either reason may not yet have spoken in man, and the physical may reign over him with a blind necessity, or reason may not be sufficiently purified from sensuous impressions, and the moral may still be subject to the physical. In both cases, the only principle that has a real power over him is the material principle, and man at least as regards his ultimate tendency, is a sensuous being. The only difference is that in the former case he is an animal without reason, and in the second case a rational animal. But he ought to be neither one nor the other. He ought to be a man. Nature ought not to rule him exclusively, nor reason conditionally. The two legislations ought to be completely independent, and yet mutually complementary.